It is well enough that people of the nation do not understand our banking and monetary system. If they did, I believe there would be a revolution before tomorrow morning. Henry Ford The next economic crisis is coming, and if you want to understand the situation and prepare yourself, then this video can be a good start, because today, I will summarize a book called Second Chance, written by Robert Kiyosaki. Kiyosaki is one of the few people who correctly predicted the 2008 financial crisis. During crisis, wealth is not destroyed. It is simply transferred from one group to another. If you study history, then you can predict the future and position yourself correctly. This book is divided into three parts, past, present, and future. Part 1. Past in the upcoming minutes, you will see how history repeats itself again and again, and how governments simply refuse to learn their lessons. Kiyosaki talks about two important terms when he is reviewing the past. First is quantitative easing, and the second is gold standard under Bretton Wood Agreement. Let us start with quantitative easing. Quantitative easing simply means printing money. You might ask why we don't just call it printing money then. Well, my assumption is that governments are usually using complex terms so that the average person does not understand what is going on. If you get into financial trouble and decide to print money in your basement, then you would be arrested for that. However, government does a very similar thing, but no one says anything. Governments usually print money when they are in economic crisis or when the money is needed for critical situations such as war. You might ask why printing money is bad. And the answer is, every time when money is being printed, poor and middle class get even poorer and rich get even richer. Printing money kills the value of the money, increases inflation and taxes. Regular people's wealth is stolen via the inflation. Inflation is certainly bad for the average person. It means the money they've worked hard to earn is suddenly less valuable. Printing money is not a new trick. It has been used by governments for many centuries. And the scary part is that it has always ended with disaster. There is no single evidence in history showing that money printing brought prosperity in the long run. It leads to poorer people and bigger government, which is ruled by political forces rather than true economic laws. Kiyosaki gives examples from the 20th century, but I will go even further back in history and start with the Roman Empire, because the further you look back in history, the further you can see the future. When the Roman Empire was faced with war, they started debasing the currency, which also means printing money. Since silver and gold coins were used as money, they started to melt them and add other metals inside to increase the money supply. They also tried another version of money printing called coin clipping, which means when the tax money was collected, they would clip the edges of the coin and then melt all the small pieces in order to create new money. They even used revaluation of the currency. The government took a one coin and then pasted a zero next to the one. And suddenly, you have a 10 coin. All these eventually led to hyperinflation, increased taxes, and economic chaos. After World War I, Germany, the Weimar Republic, also started to print money in order to pay high war reparations, which led to hyperinflation and eventually brought Hitler to power. If you were a millionaire in Germany in 1918, by the end of 1923, you were completely broke. Let me give you an example to understand how German hyperinflation looked like after printing money. Imagine it is summer and you go out with your friend to drink beer, but instead of ordering one beer, finishing it, and then ordering the second one, you order two beers at once. You know that second beer will get quite hot, but you still buy two beers at once because by the time you finish the first beer, the money in your pocket will lose its value and you will not be able to buy the second beer. This is hyperinflation. This is the disastrous result of printing money. Romans did it, Chinese did it, English did it, 
Germans did it, Zimbabwe did it, and it always ended badly. Now, America is doing it. Governments never learn from the monetary history. Einstein once said, Insanity is to do the same thing over and over and expect different results. Now that we understand what printing money means, let us talk about the end of the gold standard in 1971 under the Bretton Woods Agreement. This was the event that speeded up the money printing even more. According to the Bretton Woods Agreement, the world was operating on a gold standard, which means other currencies were tied to the dollar and the dollar was tied to gold, all with a fixed exchange rate. For every dollar in circulation, there had to be an equal amount of gold stored in the reserve so that in case some bank or country wanted gold, they could bring a dollar and exchange it with gold and vice versa. Theoretically, in the gold standard, government should not simply print money without increasing its gold reserves. However, in reality, America did print money even in the gold standard. And it came to a point that there was a lot of printed money which was not backed by any gold. So if people started to demand gold in return for their dollars, America would not be able to give back their gold. The next logical step from America's perspective was to end the gold standard, which eventually happened in 1971. American President Nixon cut the last tie between gold and the dollar, which meant America could now print money easily, as much as they wanted. Money became a tool in the hands of government and politicians. Since 1971, America has done three quantitative easings, and each time the situation gets worse and worse. Printing money is like building a house on the sand. You know that it will collapse eventually, but instead of stopping the construction and finding a solid foundation, you keep building it. And when problems happen, you simply find some way to prevent the house from falling apart. Once you start printing it, it is very hard to stop it. Stopping it means tearing down the house and starting all over again, which is something most of the politicians don't want to do during their service and be remembered badly. So everyone is pushing the problem to the next administration, and the show keeps going on. If you want to see the effects of money printing, then look at the following factors. One, since 1913 until 2018, the dollar has lost 95% of its purchasing power. This makes life difficult for those who work for money. Two, the number of food stamps has reached a very high level. If you don't know, food stamps are a government support for people who cannot earn enough money for living. Three, the middle class is shrinking. The gap between rich and poor is very high. Four, sizes or grams of products in the markets get smaller. It looks like it is the same price and the same product, but the weight or number of packs inside get reduced. This is very similar to the coin clipping we discussed above, but this time it is happening on products. Five, when the economy is in a bubble, stock prices and real estate prices go up. Everything looks good outside, except average people get poorer. Six, look at the interest rates on savings. It is around one to 2%. There is so much printed money in circulation, and banks don't want your money. Now you might look at all this and say that it is in America. It does not apply to us. Well, I think this kind of thinking would be too naive. The world economy is tied together more strongly than ever. Kiyosaki says that around 70% of world currencies are held as US dollars. The US dollar is the reserve currency of the world. You don't have to be an economics professor to understand that if the U.S. goes down, the world goes down with it. Another dangerous thing is that almost all the world currencies are fiat currencies, which means they are just paper. There is no gold or other thing that is backing them up. And history shows that all fiat currencies eventually return to their original value, which is zero. There is no single evidence showing that the same thing will not happen to the dollar. The dollar has already lost 95% of its value. How long do you think it will take to lose the remaining 5%? According to Kiyosaki, what we are experiencing currently is not a financial crisis. It is an educational crisis. 
people don't understand what is happening, and that is how governments can get away with printing money. And it is not just the U.S. government. Other governments print as well. The fact that we don't learn anything about money in school is not a mistake or an accident. It is part of the plan. In the past, they did not allow slaves to read and write because they were afraid that slaves would start demanding their rights. Government directs us to a certain direction, and that direction is not designed to benefit the average person. It is designed to benefit Wall Street and the ultra-rich. Most of us are being advised to work hard, save money, and invest for the long term in the stock market. Kiyosaki says, you don't have to trust me, but simply think for a moment and compare this advice with the facts we discussed above and ask yourself, does it make sense to work hard for money when working harder leads to paying more taxes and the money you earn loses its value plus the prices of products go up? Does it make sense to save money when government is printing money? Does it make sense to invest long-term in the stock market when the stock market is being manipulated and companies take a huge portion of your profit via fees? Kiyosaki says that if you simply start questioning and researching all the things you have been told, you'll soon realize that none of them work in your favor. Part 2. Present When crises happen, people who suffer the most are the ones on the left side of the cash flow quadrant, employees, and self-employed. Because these are the people who work for money, and they will be the first ones to lose. True wealth is on the right side of the cash flow quadrant. People on this side don't work for money. They work for assets such as land, real estate, and businesses. The author recommends transitioning from the left side of the cash flow quadrant to the right side, where true wealth exists. And in order to do that, he recommends choosing one of the four asset classes. In case you don't know, the four asset classes are businesses, real estate, commodities, and paper assets, such as stocks and bonds. Business is the hardest asset class to acquire, but also the most profitable. On the other end, paper assets are the easiest to acquire, but less profitable and riskier. From recent interviews with the author, I have seen that he does not recommend investing in paper assets. He thinks that the stock market has become a big casino, where the winners are always the owners. The author's personal favorite asset type is real estate, and he thinks it would be best if you chose something that you have passion for. Part 3. Future Let's recap what we discussed in previous parts. In the first part, we learned that government prints money, and it badly affects people who work for money and save money. In the second part, we learned that true wealth is on the right side of the cash flow quadrant. Finally, in this part, I will share some of the advice from the book on how to transition from the left side to the right side of the cash flow quadrant. The author's first advice is to get financially educated by playing the cash flow game. The first best way to learn something is by actually doing it. And the second best way is through simulation, which is what the cash flow game is all about. We usually remember 10% of the information by reading or listening. Compared to this, with simulation, this number goes up to 90%. Play the game over and over so that everything sinks in, and then start playing it in real life. The author says that there are many cash flow clubs all around the world, and people are educating one another. However, some of these clubs are using the game to attract people for their own business and maybe sell you something at the end. So do your own research if you plan to join a club. The second advice is to become an entrepreneur. An employee and an entrepreneur are two completely different people. Their approach and mindset differ a lot. We always hear, study well and get a good job in a big company. But we rarely hear, study hard and become an entrepreneur. That is why people don't realize that there is another option. They don't even consider it as an option. We are trained enough to ask for fish, but not trained enough to catch a fish. In communism, government must build the houses and provide jobs. But in capitalism, individuals build the economy. Unfortunately, most people still live in the communism mindset and expect the government to take care of everything. 
The author strongly advises becoming an entrepreneur because taxes and law are written in favor of entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs are the ones who are building the economy, creating new jobs, developing real estate, and investing. Government needs entrepreneurs, otherwise there would be no jobs and government could not collect taxes. Many people think becoming an entrepreneur is risky, so they want a secure job in a company. But there is no secure job thing anymore. Most of the jobs are moving to India, the Philippines, and other cheap countries. Having a job is actually riskier than becoming an entrepreneur because when you have a job, you only have one client, and that is your employer. If he fires you, then you are in deep trouble. But if you are an entrepreneur, you have many clients. Advice three, don't live below your means, expand your means. If you go to a financial planner, he will look at your expenses and advise you to cut the expenses. So you will stop drinking lattes. Kiyosaki says, why don't we look at the other side of the equation and find ways to expand our means so that the price of a latte becomes nothing. Cutting expenses is a passion killer. Don't kill your passion, rather find ways to feed your passion. Always ask, how can I afford it? Advice four, learn how to use debt and taxes to acquire more assets. Since 1971, money has become debt. When people tell you to get out of debt, they tell you to get out of money. Of course, I am talking about good debt, which is a debt used to purchase assets that put money into your pocket, not the one used to buy liabilities, such as a TV, car, nice vacation, etc. Advice five, don't be afraid of making mistakes and failing. It's just part of the process. Simply remember how many times you had to fall before you learned how to ride a bike successfully. As a disclaimer, I want to inform you that I am not a financial expert and strongly recommend doing your own research. What is right for the author or for me can be completely wrong for you. Becoming an entrepreneur is a tough job and maybe you don't want to work hard, be stressed out, and take full responsibility. Maybe you don't care about assets and you are happy to be in debt and driving around with a Mercedes. It's your life, and it is not my business or anyone else's business to tell you what to do with it. Thanks for watching.